Hello and welcome to another episode of From the Vault. On this episode, we are going to explore Dragon Magazine issue 94. Now, this is a special issue because this was actually the first subscription issue that I had. Um, my parents, as a, I want to say a Christmas present maybe, maybe it was a birthday present, I'm not really sure, they had gotten me this subscription to Dragon Magazine. So, um, this is from February of 1985. And um, it's a pretty interesting issue, and there's a little backstory on the cover that I wanted to share with you. So, the cover was done by Clyde Caldwell. The first Clyde Caldwell painting we've published in more than a year is the striking portrait of a female ranger. The model was Jean Stanley of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, who met Clyde when both of them were attending the 1984 Gen Con game convention. So um, it's, a, it's a beautiful cover, and it's, I remember thinking at the time, and I'm, I'm pretty sure when I was 12 that I didn't read the notes about the cover, but um, I still remember like thinking at the time how very realistic the, the cover looked. Um, and, and so now, looking back this many years later, it, it's not a big surprise that, um, you know, that it's based on, on an actual model. So, um, so yeah, Gene Stanley, you know, if, if you see this, that's you on the cover. Looks pretty cool. Um, but the cover is also very interesting for a couple other reasons. I think kind of the setting is a very classical D&D looking setting. I'm assuming that the character that she's portraying is a ranger. Um, I'm making that assumption based on her clothes, on her bow, and her animal companion. Uh, so it's kind of a cool, um, again, like a cover that could inspire an adventure or an NPC or a pair of NPCs in your campaign. So this is, uh, it's also a pretty interesting issue because it's a good mix of different games and also kind of game supplements. So, um, right off the bat, I uh, wanted to show this. There's, this is an ad, and, and you know sometimes I like to look at the ads in these Dragon magazines, not just the articles, because they're reflective of the time that this was published and the environment in gaming, in the culture of gaming. Um, so, four exciting games suited to everyone's taste. Talisman. In this introductory fantasy game, two to six players embark on a magical quest for the talisman, which will enable them to assume the crown of command and rule the land. Each player chooses one of 14 different character classes, each with their own skills, which they must use to advantage to win the game. Um, so the other one is Battle Cars, the next one is Doctor Who, and the last one is Golden Heroes. Never played any of those games except for Talisman, but boy did we play Talisman. We played the hell out of Talisman, and we played um, uh, all, I, I don't know how many expansions there were, but my friend Justin just had amassed all these different Talisman expansions over the years as well. So it was one of our favorite board games to play, because I, th I think one of the reasons is that it was like D&D in some capacity. I mean, you didn't have really complex role playing, but there were fantasy elements that were shared with D&D, um, and yet it was a board game. So we, we used to play Talisman, um, you know, we'd play hours of D&D, &D, and then we'd take a break and go do something else, ride bikes, go swimming, whatever, play ping pong, um, and then we'd come back and play Talisman. So it was almost part of the fabric of our lives for a few years there in probably fifth through seventh grade. Um, but a great game, and if you know Talisman, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, Good luck finding a vintage version because I think they're, because of nostalgia, they're all just crazy expensive. But I know that the game has been reprinted. I haven't tried playing the new version of it, but uh, Classic Talisman was a blast. So anyway, um, moving into our issue. Um, so I, I read you the note about the cover and Clyde Caldwell. I don't think I have seen any of his other covers, so there may be a gap of a few years there between 1982 and 1985 where I didn't get the magazine. And uh, so I'd like to find out as I try to get more back issues, 
if there are any other cool Caldwell covers. Um, all right, so moving along, letters to the editor, the usual stuff. And then here's a full page ad for Dragonlance Chronicles, Volume 1, Dragons of Autumn Twilight. So full disclosure, I never got into the Dragonlance books. I think I tried to read them back in the day, and it just didn't click. Um, I'm not knocking anybody who loves that stuff, but for me, it just wasn't my cup of tea. So, um, But I remember, even though I wasn't into it, I remember how huge they were and how really prominent they were and how much people in D&D &D were embracing this content. Um, and I, I could see why, because it seemed like it was, you know, well-developed. Um, the authors were, you know, pretty legendary in terms of the world of fantasy, or at least they are now. But um, so, yeah, so cool stuff. Uh, little side note, on this left side of the page, um, there is an ad for um, Dragon Riders of Pern Come to Life. So this is um, based on Anne McCaffrey's novels. Somebody put together a game, a picture book game, um, using the system that was pioneered in Ace of Aces. So Aces of, Ace of Aces was, and I think still is, just a really brilliant game. Um, you'd have pictures on certain pages, and then deciding in Ace of Aces which way to fly your plane and what kind of move to make, you would turn to another page, right? And then your opponent would have a similar book and, and they would pick a move and that would turn them to a certain page. And somehow through genius of game design, this all worked and you'd either shoot down your enemy or your enemy would shoot you down. So it was a great kind of fun game because you only needed those two books to play. Um, and I used to play with my older brother who taught me how to play D&D. He had picked up the game somewhere along the way, and uh, we used to play on road trips, family road trips in the car. This is back before there were, you know, things that you could do in the car other than count the number of, you know, telephone posts you pass by. So it was awesome. It was a great game. So I never played this, this dragon version, but I'm familiar with Ace of Aces, so it looks cool. Um, it'd be neat to see what that looked like if I could ever find a, a version of that. So yeah, um, Indiana Jones game, role-playing game. Um, never played that before. I wonder if anybody did. I'm sure people did, but um, yeah. I think if I was gonna play in the genre of Indiana Jones, I would just play Call of Cthulhu, but that's just me. Um, okay, first big article by Gary Gygax. Official changes for rangers. New rules to clear up tracking and hacking. So this, this is kind of an interesting article. Um, when Gygax said it was official, that meant it was official. Now, which edition it became official in or through which expansion content, whether it's you know Unearthed Arcana, what, whatever it was, um, I can't tell you. I don't remember the chronology and the release of those books, but What's kind of cool is to see how, in, in this article, Gary kind of brings in that, that grognard sensibility in determining more specifics for how to calculate how well rangers can track, right? So rather than keeping it just arbitrary and letting the DM kind of decide and then the player rolls a die, it's, it's a lot more tied into elements of what I would call like realism, right? So he has a table for terrain modifiers um, where your percentage is affected by whether or not they're soft terrain or you know harder terrain or some kind of terrain that prevents all but the minutest traces of passages. There is additional modifiers for each creature beyond the first in the group being tracked for every 12 hours of time elapsed since the trail was made. For each hour of precipitation that has fallen on the trail between tracker and quarry. So those are all like outdoor tracking modifiers. And they're all based on realistic things. You know, I'm not a hunter myself, but I'm sure if you were a hunter or a tracker, that those would be things that you would, you know, have to consider. Like if it had rained or if there was, you know, debris, how much time had elapsed since the tracks were there and how many people, how deep the tracks were 
what the earth was, you know, whether it was like a, a thick mud or whether it was, you know, loose stuff that was washed away or easily disturbed. So all of those would be realistic things, right? So it makes sense that he would want that because when you, you know, when, when the originator of Dungeons and Dragons is, is a war gamer and all the play testers, all the early dudes were, war gamers like crunchy things and they like, you know, very specific detailed things based on realism because a lot of the games that they played were historical reenactment kind of strategy games. Um, so it kind of makes sense that they would add these sort of things in. And then in another column, he has indoor tracking. So these are modifiers so that a ranger could use those skills indoors, right? So this includes like surface condition modifiers, whether it's a dirt floor or unused and dusty areas. You know, if it was that kind of thing, it would give you a greater percentage modifier to be able to tr make uh, follow the tracks. If it's a wood floor or area which allows some occasional indication of passage, or if it's a stone floor, which prevents all but the minute, minutest traces of passage. Um, then he has other modifiers here as well. And then he has, the, the article continues on with light condition and outdoors and indoors, um, whether the tracks are obvious, if there's illumination to follow the tracks. Then he has a whole thing on identifying tracks, right? So on this page, um, he has the ranger level, which is, you know, what their ability to identify relates. So at first level, they can uh, common woodland creatures, tracks, and direction of travel. Second level, common woodland creatures and number and pace. Um, you know, by 10th level, it's um, the ability to determine the general size and weight, um, whether they're mounted or not, how much weight the horse is carrying, um, all sorts of stuff, right? So the idea being that at higher levels, the information that they gain or what they can identify from their tracking success role um, is increased. Now, it just seems like a lot of things to have to track, right? Whereas like in a more modern game like D&D 5e, you know, you'd have your ranger make their role and then based on the success of that role, the DM would feed them the information that they would know. And you could just estimate based on their level or their proficiency or whether that particular, you know, track is important and you need to feed it into the storyline. Like that's all stuff that I could determine in five seconds without having to look up a table and have anybody make a role. Um, but again, you know, when you wanted specifics, when you wanted realism, when you wanted details, they added in these kind of crunchy things. You know, it's, it's math, literally. I mean, they're giving you information with a plus or a minus percentile so that you could do more math and it could be more realistic, right? Instead of just thinking about the story. And yeah, so now I'm injecting my preference for story-based role-playing versus crunchy role-playing. Um, Villains and Vigilantes. So that was a game that I also never played, but I used to see those ads in every issue of Dragon Magazine. Um, I played the Marvel superhero games from TSR. I tried Champions one time. Talk about crunchy. Wow. Wow. Champions is very complex. Um, yeah, so never played Villains and Vigilantes. Next article by Catherine Kerr. An army travels on its stomach. This is large-scale logistics in a fantasy world. So this article was fascinating to read, but wow, crunchy, just wow. Um, when we talk about players and DMs and resources that provide you with a ton of realism, that's what this article is all about. So basically, she articulates how an army would realistically have had to travel. Right? what it would have meant to have an army on the march, on the road. And she goes into details that are, I, I am certain that this is like researched through, you know, records from medieval kingdoms. I mean, she has so much detail, it's crazy. Like, I'm gonna just cut to an example, the minimum daily requirement. Each warrior needs 3,500 calories a day, including 70 grams of protein, to stay in fighting trim and good condition. In prolonged battle conditions, he requires 4,000 calories and 80 grams of protein. I mean, that, that's fascinating. I, 
the historical lover in me was like, wow, this is so cool. You know, she's talking about um, our typical medieval style army might comprise 500 mounted warriors, 500 mixed pikemen and archers, 200 non-combatant personnel, and 180 pack horses carrying the non-edible gear. In one single day, this army eats 10,400 pounds of grain, 6,800 pounds of mixed animal fodder, and 1,200 pounds of mixed human rations. We're talking, in short, of over nine tons of food every day, and this is only a small army. Even a squad of 50 mounted men traveling without non-combatants and pack animals would need 650 pounds of grain, 500 pounds of fodder, and 25 pounds of mixed rations a day. I mean, again, huge respect for the authenticity and maybe the historical accuracy of this, but then I'm trying to think about the practical application. Like, why would that really matter? Couldn't you just ballpark it? Like, if your players, if you're a DM and your players want to have like an army, if they're high enough level now where they're marching off, couldn't you just say, you know, ballparking that you have a couple dozen or a couple hundred, you know, workers, serfs, servants, whatever, and pack animals and wagons full of all your supplies? Like, why would you spend that much time doing the math to figure out the exact caloric need of each soldier? Think about that for a second. Boop, boop. So yeah, I mean this, and it's not just like a two-pager. This thing goes on and on and on. She talks about water consumption. She talks about living off the land. And then, because I told you it was crunchy, on this table is a table of food production. So it's broken down into land types, and then how much those land types can produce in grain, fodder, meat, vegetables, and other, right? So rich arable land can produce 4,500 tons of grain, 600 tons of fodder, two tons of meat, two tons of vegetables, 500 pounds of ale, cheese, butter, and then it goes down through poor arable land, forest, wild scrubland, wild grassland, and pastoral. Then there's uh, footnotes, uh, that describe how it includes fruit, wild game, um, blah, blah, blah. So if you really wanted to calculate, you know, the area, the terrain that your army was marching through and the availability of resources there, you, you have a table now for that. Wow. Um, she talks about taking your stuff with you. So, you know, let's say you're living off the land, you, you, either raid some farms or you just demand um, the farmers relinquish their crops or whatever to you. Now you have to take it with you. They talk about how the pack animals, how much they can carry, what their consumption is, how long they can pull. See the details going in here? It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Craziness. Then there's another part, same article. Horse care, a matter of life and death, right? Probably totally accurate, historically accurate, biologically accurate. I mean, this lady, mad props. Like, I, I don't know who she is. Maybe she was a librarian, but whatever she did, she did her research. But wow, do, is it really that important to know about the horse care? I don't know. Moving it along. It keeps going. You thought this article was done. It's not. Logistics of the game. Including logistics in a campaign does more than add a certain, uh, let me, I have to press this down, a certain note of realism to play. Gamers forced to operate within the limits of their armies will have to, will have to make fascinating strategic decisions, while game masters can add those extra touches that keep campaign dangerous, keep campaigns dangerous to the overbold and rewarding to the clever. Yeah, I could think of like 8,000 other things to keep my campaign inter interesting than having to calculate the caloric needs of an army. Um, yep. So there's a bibliography. Warfare and Feudal Europe, the Agricultural Systems of the World, Alexander the Great and the Logistics of the Macedonian Army, and the Draft Horse Primer. So Lady did her research. And again, it's a fascinating article, but as a DM who focuses on moving the story along, I would not implement that much complexity. I just wouldn't. 
no point. OK, same dice, different odds. <laughs> so this, this is yet another crunch-tastic article. Um, basically, it's talking about divided roles and how they add variety and uncertainty. Um, I could not begin to explain to you how much time whoever, this is written by David G. Weeks. I'm guessing David spent a little bit of time thinking about all this and pro probably a little more testing it out to get all of his research and you know make, make all of his calculations all make sense. But in essence, it kind of argues that there are different ways to roll. Okay, and I'm, I'm just gonna excerpt this. Um, there's probability, right? And there's probability in figure 1B, and then there's probability in figure 1C. And, and what he suggests is, is that um, the first two have symmetry, and the other one is asymmetrical. And the reason why it's asymmetrical is because it has a low probability event. Um, so how do you achieve that? And this is where he delves into his technique. A divided die roll is created by dividing the result of one roll by another roll. For instance, for a d20 divided by d4 divided die roll, simply roll a d4, d20 and a d4, divide the number on the d20 by the number on the d4, and round the result to the nearest integer. The distribution of d20 divided by d4 is plotted in figure 2. This diagram is an asymmetric distribution, just like the one in figure 1c. The most common number produced will be between 1 and 6, inclusive. But there is a slight chance that the damage could go as high as 20. So practically speaking, why, why would you math this much, right? I kind of get it. And in a sense, it is cool. It adds a little sliver of excitement. It's kind of like that, that excitement when we have a critical hit, right? But when you roll a d20 and you're playing with a critical hit, you roll a 20, right? And that's it. You got that flat odd of rolling a 20. And even if you roll a 20 and you implement your critical damage, it's not necessarily that significant. Whereas with this system, you could come up with a way to have damage that's crazy off the charts significant if you do the divided die roll, right? So let's use this example with a d20 and a d4. So if I roll the 16 um, on, the, on the d20, and the d4 was um, a 2, then I just did 8 damage, right? Or if it was a 4, I would have done only 4 damage. So let's say you're using a weapon, and you decide that the weapon damage is going to be a divided die of d20 divided by d4. You're typically going to do whatever, you know, 1 to 6 or 1 to 8 damage, right? But on that one freak roll where you go and you roll a 20 on the d20 and a 1 on the d4, you just did 20 damage, right? That's where this kind of can be exciting. It's a little bit like a, a gambler's dream, right? Because the odds are very not much in your favor that you're going to roll that. So that's all this is. It's just a bunch more math. And I, I mean, I imagine you could implement it relatively easy, easily once you understand how it works. Um, but I just go back to it and I'm like, why? Why, who cares? Like, why would you need to roll that, you know? If, I don't know. It just doesn't seem worth that much having to figure out and reconstruct the system. Because in the end, that's what it is. To, to implement a divided die roll, you'd have to go through all the weapons and look at the damage types and figure out the right divided die combination to make it fair where, where the, even though it's asymmetric, the, the, um, the most common numbers would be between that range that it normally would have been in a regular damage dice roll, for example. It wouldn't be that hard, but you know, you're basically recreating the wheel just so that you have that one chance at flair. I don't know, to me that's not the point of the game, but you get where I'm going with this. Oh wait, you don't have to recreate the system. He did it for us. On table one, I'll hold that up so you can see it. Crease my old magazine really good. Okay. 
So table one shows us the divided roll, the selected average, the near, probability of the result being zero, and 95%. So 95% are at or below that number. Well, there you go. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but Jesus, I mean, more charts. Again, for those who've never tuned in to an episode of From the Vault, you've probably gotten the gist by now that I'm not really into crunchy stuff. And it's for a good reason, because many years in my early, early years of gaming with neighborhood groups and random other groups throughout the early and mid 80s, uh, I would game with people who would spend more time looking up rules or arguing about rules and then looking them up than actually playing the game. And to me, playing the game is the point. That's why they call it a role-playing game. So um, I don't really care for the crunch. Next article. This is dope. Text by Kim Eastland. Photos by Dan Sample. This is a feature article about a piece of terrain that was built. And I'm big into terrain now. I don't remember this article from back in the day. I must have just glossed over it, but it's pretty cool. Somebody made this diorama. Let's talk specifically. The last two issues of Dragon Magazine have contained photographs of some of the prize-winning entries from the Miniature Open Contest at the 1984 Gen Con convention, but we saved the best for last. Pictured on these two pages is Reptiliate Attack by Eric Heaps of Milwaukee the diorama that won the prestigious Masters competition. The scene includes dozens of figures from Ramph's Reptiliad line, regular infantry, Gillaworm infantry, newts, blah, 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 blah. There are spotters in the trees and many figures that are all but obscured by the surrounding foliage, even scratch-built snakes. In short, enough features to keep someone looking at the diorama for several minutes just to take in everything that's there. Um, it's cool. Great, it's artistry. Um, it's a diorama though. So it's, there's a difference I think between dioramas and practical terrain. A diorama is a piece of art that you make and you could look at it when it's done, but you're not gonna put it on your table and move shit around, right? Whereas practical terrain on your table is stuff that you can reconfigure, maybe it's modular, maybe it's reusable, maybe you can mess with it and you know it's, it's more practical. That's why I call it practical terrain. So this is really cool, but skipping. The Ecology of the Chimera by Ed Greenwood. So here, the great wizard um, provides us with an in-depth look at the Chimera. And it was a great article. I love this kind of stuff because it is story-based. Gives you more background. Um, here's a little snippet. Chimera is a stupid beast, but it needs little finesse to survive with the powers it possesses. It seldom cooperates with other creatures, but only rarely does one Chimera fight with another. A Chimera ranges widely while hunting, trusting to its powers to keep it safe from harm, avoiding only large cities or the lairs of creatures that have bested it before. It is a clumsy flyer, able to use its fiery breath or only one of its heads or its claws in aerial combat. It prefers to pounce from flight or high ground onto prey, using its bulk to drive its victim to the ground where it can rake with its lion-like foreclaws and bite unhampered. Um, he goes on to explain a little more about the types of Chimera. Um, he talks about the Thessalmera but there's no picture, really, Ed? That sucks. I'll just read the description to you, because words. The very rare Thessalmera layers in swamps, jungles, or caverns, and can endure extremes of climate with impunity. A sterile crossbreed of Thessalhydra and Chimera, the cunning Thessalmera is often found close to civilization, where it can feed upon isolated bands of travelers or upon livestock, hunting in stealth by night. It preys chiefly on the choicest of red-blooded creatures, man. The Thessalmera has the scaled lizard-like body and pincer-clawed tail of the Thessalhydra, six to eight snake-like heads, a central lion's head, and a red dragon-like head. And then it talks about all the 
damage that it can inflict, which is pretty fearsome, actually. 10 hit dice, breath weapon poison, immune to petrification and acid. Yeah, it's a pretty badass monster. Um, so anyway, kind of a cool, um, cool addition there. Don't know if that was ever published in any official hardcover versions, but that's cool. Here's a neat two-page ad. Look for the yellow label label at participating retailers and save up to 65% on dozens of popular TSR products. Ah, oh, that would have been awesome. I'd like there to be a 10% a sale now on everything. Um, here's an ad for Twilight 2000. Now, I can't remember if I mentioned this, but this was an awesome game. Um, and it came out in a time when the possibility of nuclear apocalypse was possible, right? All-out war was possible. Like, we were the United States and the Soviet Union, you know? So, and it was such a kind of a cool way to open up options. Like, the original sets were, were set up, um, I want to say in, like, Poland or Warsaw. Like, it would be, oh, I can't remember the original setting, but... I think it was in Poland. It might have been Warsaw, specifically within Poland. And you could choose from being like um, one of the US 5th Division soldiers, or you could be like um, someone else from NATO. There were like a couple different options. It had a really cool system. It was kind of crunchy, not like Aftermath level or Champions level crunchy. Um, it was playable, and we did play it. My brother ran quite a few games uh, for us. And I had planned actually a few games, but I never, I never got to run them. But it was an awesome um, set, and it came with a lot of very, I think at the time I perceived it as like very realistic military stuff, and and you know specs on guns and other weapons and and on vehicles. So it just felt like you were really immersed in this in this environment, you know. Um, it's funny, of course, that it's Twilight 2000 because it's 2017. But you know, back in '85, that was only that was like 15 years away, and that could have happened. So that was Game Designers Workshops. Um, okay, so game review. I like when these magazines have a game review. Um, an interesting thing: Tim Cask, who is one of the great masters uh, that helped create D&D. Uh, mentioned on his YouTube channel on a recent podcast about how Dragon Magazine, when they were first starting it off, when he was talking with Gary Gygax about it, that they didn't want it to be um, crap. I'm forgetting the term that he used. They didn't basically want it to be a magazine that just pawned off its own products. They wanted it to explore more than just their house products. And he used a term for it. And I forgot now because. Um, so I like that Dragon Magazine isn't just going over just TSR stuff, right? They're going over other companies. They have ads for products from other companies. They have reviews. So that's kind of cool. Uh, Mercenaries, Spies, and, SB, and, and Private Eyes. Mercenaries, Spies, and Private Eyes. I remember seeing this game on the shelves. I never played it. Um, I did play Top Secret, but it's cool that that um, Dragon had a review for it. The Adventure of the Jade Jaguar, small solo, solo adventure released along with that game. Stormhaven, um, Stormhaven Manor. Yeah, so it looks like there was some content being released for that game. And again, I never played it, just like I never played Cyworld. I saw the ad for it all the time, never played it. Um, on this page, we have the convention calendar. So, yay, remember, this is before the interwebs. Um, there might have been bulletin boards, which were things that you could call up from your computer at home using your phone and connect with a limited number of users and share information. But this magazine was your resource, right? It had all the cool things going on there. The role of books. More reviews, book reviews. Secret of the Sixth Magic by Lyndon Hardy. Never read it. Looks cool. R.A. McAvoy, Raphael, The Song of the Axe by Paul O. Williams, Dark Angel by Meredith Ann Pierce, The Harem of Aman Akbar by Elizabeth Scarborough, Exiles of the Rinth, 
Rint, Rint by Carol Nelson Douglas. So again, there's your resource for all your nerdy needs. Um, here's Ral Partha, full page article showing some of their dope minis, dopest dragons to be specific. Um, here is an article by Tracy Hickman about the Dragonlance group known as the Knights of Salamnia. So as I said earlier this episode, never really got into Dragonlance, but for those of you geeks who did, this is a real big um, background article all about the Knights of Salamnia and some of the major players in that organization. And then she has additional notes on Salamnia. Salamnia is on the silver standard. The most valuable coin of the realm is a silver monarch, equivalent to 500 silver pieces in the world outside Kryn. Yeah, so anyway, Creature Catalog 2. Yay! This is the meat and potatoes of this issue. Not as if I haven't spent enough time on the rest of the crap, but there's a whole bunch of monsters in this. This is what Dragon Magazine was for, right? Was getting all this cool stuff that was like ahead of schedule. You know, it's like you were getting a sneak peek into TSR's magical lair and you were kind of getting an opportunity to learn about some of the stuff that would later be coming out in other books. And some of it maybe didn't come out in books. I don't know. I don't know if you, they used all this, but we have a Balabra, which looks like a horrible floating tentacle creature, um, a giant beta, fi beta fish, beta fish, a bear gala, a phase dragon, an ekrat, a fireball fly, a fire star, a flame wing, a hergen, a lightning bug, giant lightning bug, a liland, a orgotha, a rekis, a rumel, looks like it's uh, just like a dog, an urisk with parentheses lubin, a vilch, which looks like a three-legged ape, and a great worm, which looks like a big long-necked dragon thing, and then a Xaver, which looks weird and alien. So, bunch of monsters, you know, gotta have that stuff to pad it out, right? Um, and I remember, like, uh, sometimes our DMs, I didn't really do this very much, but I remember playing in games where the DMs would pull out monsters and they would like mispronounce the name. And then you were like, what, what the hell is that? I've never even heard of that, you know? And sometimes they were things that they pulled out from Dragon Magazine. So here's a short story, which are, you know, they're fun to read. This is Fortunes of a Fool by Nicholas Yermakov. I'm not going to read it to you because this episode's already running long. Aries, science fiction gaming section. Now. I don't remember when this started in Dragon Magazine, but I know it was here in the issues 90 range um, because it was here. So, and I remember this section and it was kind of exciting because they focused on a lot of the TSR games that I enjoyed other than D&D at the time. So sometimes they'd pop in some, some Marvel superheroes or Gamma World or whatever, you know, some, some of those kind of more sci-fi things. So in this one, it's S.H.I.E.L.D., all about S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, Marvel Superheroes game supplement. So they've got all the big players in S.H.I.E.L.D. there. They talk about the Helicarrier. Not only do they talk about it, they have a freaking blueprint right there for you um, with side views, top views, cutaways, all that. Um, they give the stats for all the major players like Nick Fury. Yeah, so, and then they have some, um, some bad guys, unfriendly neighborhood spider foes. So they've got Hobgoblin, there's an ad for the game. Kingpin, Spider-Man's suit, the alien syndrome. Um, okay, so here is an article uh, intended to provide game masters with more information for the game Star Frontiers, which was a beloved game in my group. We played Star Frontiers for many years in the 80s. And it was that was our sci-fi game, great game. And I think we took it a lot farther than it was intended to be taken um, because in a lot of ways, people, other people that I knew that played Star Wars played it more like a strategy game. They were very focused on the map and grids and pieces. And we really liked the role-playing element of it. So this is cool. Um, it was by David Cook, who's just you know one of the, the legends. Um, David Zeb Cook. So um, this is about interstellar governments, planetary governments, human and alien societies. It's just fleshing out the game, right? So for people who are story-driven and want context, 
it's all awesome background material and not a ton of tables and stats and math. Um, okay, here's another short story. This one not fantasy, but more in line with the sci-fi uh, component of the Ares section of Dragon. The Gun That Shot Too Straight by Ralph Roberts. Pretty cool, pretty cool. A couple pages. And then we have the Gamer's Guide. So this is the back section with all the little ads, um, minis for sale, art, custom character designs, different game stores, that kind of stuff. Of course, my favorite comic from Dragon, Wormy. Um, there's your boy right there. This one is uh, several pages. We have yet to still encounter my favorite character from the Wormy comics, but that'll be in future episodes. Then Dragon Mirth, which are kind of like the shorts, the black and white um, newspaper style comics. This one's funny. When I said breath weapon, I meant fire, stupid. And the guy's got like a big toothpaste backpack and a giant toothbrush. Haha, -ha, nerd humor. Snarf Quest. I loved Snarf Quest. That was like my, that and Wormy were tied. Um, so Snarf Quest was done by Larry Elmore. And I think the reason why I loved it is because it reminded me of Conan the Barbarian, the Conan the Barbarian comic books from the 80s. That same kind of vibe, the same style. I don't know, I, I just, I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Um, or Cerebus, Cerebus, for those of you who remember that comic. So just kind of ongoing silly adventures, um, but great stuff. And that's it. The last page of the magazine is an ad for Paranoia, which was another big game back in the 80s. And the back cover's Rollmaster. Paranoia was one of those games where I had fun playing it once, and I wish I could have played it more. So that's it from the vault. Focusing on Dragon Magazine issue number 94. Hope you enjoyed this one. Um, hope my rambling is somehow insightful to you all. If you have questions or comments or feedback, leave them politely in the comments below. Um, if there's something you want me to look delve into deeper with future stuff, let me know that. Um, but otherwise, thanks for tuning in and thanks for subscribing. And we'll see you on the next episode.